So there are many solutions to this in astronomy. The brute force one is you get above the atmosphere. That's the solution of Hubble Space Telescope. Hubble Space Telescope has been wonderful, but it's important to re recognize that Hubble Space Telescope in the astronomical world has a relatively modest mirror diameter. The diameter is only 2.4 meters. And on the ground, we have much larger telescopes, in particular the Keck telescopes, a factor of four times bigger. So in principle, at the same wavelength, we should be able to get a factor of four times smaller, to, uh, factor of four times smaller scale. And fortunately, there's been a tremendous amount of progress in methods for overcoming the distortions introduced by the Earth's atmosphere. And this is where I have um, basically come in because my passion has been to use these um, technologies to develop them and to use or to apply them to um, astronomical pro uh, problems. Um, and this has been just the perfect example uh, of a great science problem that's been solved with the, um, applying these um, new techniques. This little animation shows you the benefit on the center of the galaxy. You can see um, in the larger um, picture the five bright stars that I was showing you the short snapshots of. Without adaptive optics, a long exposure, you um, basically integrate over all those speckle uh, structures and you get a blurred fuzzy pattern. Um, we, we in astronomy like to use a unit that's uh, uh, an arc second. Uh, so an arc second is basically the scale that you get without using your high resolution imaging techniques. The key to the, this experiment is, uh, are the stars that are inside that box. That box has a scale of about an arc second. You can see without these um, techniques, you can't see the stars. <laughs> So you can't tell how fast they're going. So that's why it was so key to actually use, it, uh, to use these um, technologies. So um, there's been a tremendous amount of progress over the time scale of this experiment. This experiment started in 1995. At the t in 1995, adaptive optics um, had not gotten to the point where it was being used at the Keck telescope. So we started with the technique of speckle imaging. I like to call it poor man's adaptive optics because you simply take a lot of short exposures and recover the small spatial scale information that's in there. So on the left, we see the, the speckle grams and you combine them. Um, and now I'm just showing you an animation of the central arc second. I love this animation. This is sort of like the old home movie. So this is like the early, this is the first decade of our experiment. And if you see in the central arc second, you see a couple stars. And in particular, there's one that you can kind of see going in a loop. That star has an orbital period of 15 years. Um, it's in some sense the star of the show um, because it's the one that tells us how much mass is confined to a very small volume. With this technology, it, well, we want, for, first of all, I should say this is actually the technology that produced the first diffraction limited images at Keck, and that these were these images from the center of the galaxy. Um, we could get an astrometric precision, which basically means an ability to find the uh, star's position on the plane of the sky, to about one milliarc second. So a factor of a thousand times better than the angular resolution without, adaptive op uh, without using any um, high resolution imaging. So this was great fun. Um, but um, adaptive optics has really revolutionized what we can do. So this technology, as many of you know, uh, allows us to correct for the distortions introduced from, uh, by the Earth's atmosphere with a deformable mirror. And what you need to do here is you need to look at not only the light from the science target, which is usually too faint to do the corrections, but a nearby star or laser. So in the beginning, it was just using natural guide stars. And um, this was wonderful in the sense that it really told you what the atmosphere was doing but only 1% of the sky has a natural star that's bright enough to do this. So it became, it was a very um, dilettante activity. Um, if you happen to have a target that was near enough a bright star, you could do it, but it was really not, um, not great for um, the rest of the astronomical community. So we made a lot of progress when um, we were able to use lasers. And so this shows actually a picture of the laser um, that one of my grad students took an, an evening that we were actually looking at the center of the galaxy, so that shows you where the center of the galaxy is. Um, and the advantage here is that we're able to stimulate a layer of sodium atoms that are deposited by meteorites up in the atmosphere. So you basically create an artificial star. You still need a, a real star to tell you what's going on because you can't correct for the tip-tilt term because you, um, the light propagates both up and back, so you don't get the overall tilt, but you get all the other wavefront errors. And this has absolutely changed what we can do, not only uh, in many other experiments, but in the Galactic Center. This little animation shows you what it, that 
the whole movie that was just an arc second and a moment ago looks like with adaptive optics. It's almost unrecognizable, except for the fact that one of those bright stars in the middle is my favorite star, SO2, and yet you can see that there's a lot of other stars that were missing um, in that earlier animation. Basically, in any way that you can measure the difference between speckle imaging and adaptive optics, it's a factor of 10 better. We like to use this term Strel ratio, which basically tells you the amount of light that you've um, corrected or that's in your diffraction limited core if you want to simplify it. 35% of the light is in the diffraction limited core here, and this is much better than the 3%. <laughs> it's actually amazing that the other experiment worked at all. Um, we're getting down to 100 micro arc second precision, so you can do experiments I, I didn't even dream of when we started this experiment. And I'm sorry, I said magnitudes here. It's astronomy way of, of talking about brightness, but basically you can see stars that are 10 times fainter. So this is a really huge step forward. And now I'm just going to show you the, um, where all these stars have gone over the last um, 15 years. Um, and remember, the key to doing this experiment is to watching how stars orbit. So we've had enough patience that SO2 has made a, huge, uh, a complete orbit, and you can see that there's a huge variety of other stars. Because technology has changed, I've also used the, um, um, the, way, the trail behind the star to denote whether or not it was a star that you could see with speckle imaging, in which case your, your trail is solid. Over the years, you could detect it. Um, uh, so it's, sorry, I misspoke. It's solid over the years that you can detect it. So the speckle imaging um, uh, stars are solid over the entire orbit. And the ones that we only pick up with adaptive optics are dotted in the beginning and then become solid lines. So you can see that there's a lot more stars for us to play with, but in the meantime, for the basic um, content of this talk, SO2 is all you need to pay attention to. So with this star, we know that there's four million times the mass of the sun, and this is rather radical um, because before this experiment um, started, it's actually Charlie Towns, who's known to this community um, in much different contexts. But in his work in astronomy, he'd actually looked at the center of the galaxy and uh, measured gas, the motion of gas. And he already noted that there was four million times the mass of the sun confined to a very large volume, which is denoted by the circle. And you can see that there's a lot of stuff inside that. Um, circle. And so while he very tentatively but correctly hinted that there might be a black hole, he, um, there were a lot of other alternatives. So with this experiment, what we've done is we've confined that 4 million times the mass of the sun to a volume that's 100, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 10, 10 to the 7th, so 10 million times smaller um, than that original experiment, which, which gives us the strength of... Um, the argument, so basically there is no other known explanation or way of shoving four million times the mass of the sun into, into a region that corresponds to the scale of our solar system. Now, if you're skeptical, and you should be, you sh you, the, the right question to ask me is how close am I to that Schwarzschild radius? <laughs> and the answer is I'm still a, thousand, uh, a factor of a thousand times out, but I'm closer than anyone has ever gotten before, not only in our galaxy, but to any other supermassive black hole. So this experiment has provided the strongest evidence yet for the existence of supermassive black holes. So this tells us that these exotic objects really do exist in our universe, and we have to contend with that. It also gives us a great opportunity for studying the astrophysics of supermassive black holes, because today the, the, the question is no longer do we have a supermassive black hole, because we're pretty convinced that the answer is yes, but we now have the closest example of a supermassive black hole that we ever get to, will ever get to study. So as I said in the beginning, the next closest galaxy is 100 times further away, so now we can look at um, how black holes interact with their environment. And there are a couple of key questions. Um, one, you'd like to know what that interaction is um, with the surrounding stars. Um, is. And the interesting thing about this is that almost every prediction that there's ever been for what you might expect in the stellar population around a black hole, we found doesn't hold up to the observations. So this is what's made this ex experiment continue to be fun. So this is a key um, question for understanding how black holes and galaxies um, grow. Um, and one of the surprising things that I'll, I'll go briefly into is that we found young stars there, and young stars have no right to be there, so we'd like to know when and where these stars formed, um, and we'd also like to know how did the black hole and galaxy form in the first place. So to